haven't yet seen these World Cup games. I was, I've been following it kind of loosely. Um, and I've heard that um, a certain Xiong is doing very well. So I thought we should go over how he did in um, round four of his World Cup. I haven't seen the games, so this is going to be like my first impressions um, and maybe some analysis a little bit. So he's having he's having a good run, from what I understand. And in round four, um, he was playing against Duda. So we'll be seeing a little bit of that. So, so far we have some symmetrical English stuff, normal moves. I, ha I have a friend um, that I haven't seen in a long time who would always um, enjoy playing the symmetrical line because in Bullet, which I think was his favorite time control, um, people would regularly overextend and lose one of their center pawns, especially the E pawn. They play E5, E4, and then they G5, and they just lose a pawn. So um, even though that's kind of a, at a more beginner level of strategy, um, it definitely is something that we see in this English quite frequently. A lot of the time, one side will invite the other to attack and then counterattack. So black is playing this d5 line, kind of like uh, trying to establish a Morose bind as black. It's kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. I wonder why they didn't choose um, e5 right away. I'm not that well versed in the lines. I think e5 is a move here, though. I'm not sure exactly what could be wrong about it, but um, it could be something. You never know. All right, give me one second. I need to fool around over here on the OBS side. Sorry. Anyway, so with this e5 line, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. Let me just take a peek at the reference here. Or maybe I could um, do some more chess-based magic. One second. That was not the kind of magic I wanted. All right, I'm going to change how everything looks here. Just one second. Sorry for making it ugly. Let's skirt this. Just gonna do a little tailoring. Sorry. Just want everything to fit on the screen. Using chess base and um, OBS at the same time is like a recipe for disaster. All right. Here we are. This looks okay. And I can see the life book. So that's what I was trying to do here on my end. Um, I don't want to make it impossible to see the board, so I'm just keeping it off screen. Anyway. So in this E5 line, it says that things are just equal after like D3. That's kind of expected. It also says that A3 scores pretty well. Both of them have been played um, in the last two days, so let's take a look. Maybe it's interesting. Oh man, that's cool. I just got a follow from Yasoa1290. Thanks for the follow. Anyway, um, so if black tries to do this reverse Marotze, it says that white is slightly better after like f6. Um, I'm not sure why though. Like e3 maybe. You have to get d4 really fast. Yeah, if you're trying to play this Morote structure and they can break with successfully, that doesn't seem 
terribly successful. The whole idea is to prevent them from breaking anywhere. So it looks like the one, the one tempo difference makes a, a big, um, big change for white and for black in trying to set up this pawn structure. Probably white will eventually get the D pawn after like B4 and eventually corral the, the pawns. I'm not sure if it should be like knight f4 or knight c3. Knight c3 looks fine. This pawn on d3 has to go sometime. So that's probably why they chose g6, even though this maneuver is reminiscent of a Marotze bind thing. And the reason I'm questioning this so much is that I realized recently that if the bishop is not on e7, this pawn can become weak. So playing g6, declaring the intention to play bishop g7, it's kind of like saying, I don't want to play e5, unless there's some kind of cool tactical justification, so. Okay, so white's playing knight a4. It's beginner chess, putting your knight on the edge of the board. But no, this is all theory. Um, so knight e6. Looks a little awkward because it's blocking this bishop. But this bishop's destiny is probably to go on a6 or b7 anyway. So, I don't think knight e6 is such a big deal. This kind of thing is typically bad, though, if white can play like f4, f5 quickly. So, but they can't, so it's probably fine. d3, knight d4. Okay, I don't think there's anything really critical to look at here. Knight d4 seems fine, why not? It might be worth noting that the move e3 is kind of just a waste because after knight takes f3, if they play queen takes f3, there's queen takes d3. Even though white gets to put d1, which is normally pretty nice, I think that the move like queen c2 is just fine because they have to start retreating and they're down a pawn. So probably they'd have to play bishop takes f3. And um, this is just like a normal position, so. Well, I'd say normal position where this bishop is not as active as it might normally be. So, um, I kind of don't think e3 is very reasonable. Bishop e3 makes a lot of sense. It's funny how in this game we're seeing minor pieces blocking center pawns on both sides. But this is quite normal for these flank openings. Because we kind of need the pawn on e2 slash e7 to support some critical squares. Like, if you put all the pawns on dark like this, it'll weaken these light squares. So frequently you won't see white playing. Sorry, you you usually will not see white playing like um, e3 in this kind of position unless they're immediately getting I don't know some kind of tactical some kind of tactical thing. Um, and same thing for black. So bishop e3 white looks pretty good here, and I see in the game notes it says white is better. Um, I believe it because the pressure on the c pawn that I predicted when they played g6 is real. All right, so here they're sacrificing a pawn, it looks like. A little bit of a risky way. In the game notes, I see that someone had previously played queen d6. But it really does feel like the queen is babysitting, which is usually not a great sign for your piece activity long term. Like knight d2, they're already looking to play knight c4. I guess knight d2 is also trying to strike this. I didn't think they'd want to trade the knights like this, though. But... Objectively, this kind of is giving an extra move to white when they trade on b3 instead of directly on d4. And it also prevents black from consolidating their structure, so I think this makes a lot of sense. This game ended in a win for white in just like 19 moves, it looks like. So let's check that out just for fun. So they fixed their structure. However, white has a lot of activity. Oh man, this is a slaughterhouse. They really could not have allowed this queen a4 move. That's just too strong. They resigned here. Um, I think the reason is that if they play bishop takes b7, there's queen b7 check. And this is going to be really bad. Really right now. So, okay, so queen d6 was not necessarily a very good try. Probably that's like plus minus or something. And castling seems somewhat reasonable, although it does give up a pawn. Um, I think if black trades on c5, it's missing an opportunity to get a lot of initiative. So 
I like that black played knight f5 here. Because if they're forced to capture on e6, it's kind of like you get a free move here. Okay, and then they chose bishop c5. Of course, white doesn't want to give up the bishop pair for nothing. This position's fairly open, so I think probably the bishops are still very important. Um, especially since this bishop is tying down the rook to the defense of a7. I think white would prefer to provoke some kind of weakening of the structure on the queen side, where they kind of stand better. This bishop is very strong, even though it hasn't done anything amazing yet. Okay, so b-pawns are exchanged. But white gets a little bit more active from rook b7. Probably um, what black is getting at by allowing this sequence is that they want to... Um, take advantage of the temporary vulnerability of this rook. So queen c8 makes a lot of sense. Now how can they save all this stuff? The only move that looks good is rook b5. Again, I, I haven't seen these games yet, so I'm just saying my first impressions here. I don't see any tactical way of guarding the rook. Like, even though the bishop is aligned with this rook, technically controlling its square, there's no useful discover attack with this knight, so you can't just give up the rook. And um, I also don't see any reason that they should allow capture of bishop c5, so rook b5 seems like the only move. a6 forces the rook to potentially a more awkward square. Normally, having a rook on a5 like this would be good, because it's putting pressure on this weak pawn. However, the structure is not like um, one where white is ready to pressure a6. Usually pressuring this pawn happens when there's no a pawn because you can bring the other rook to support and then hammer this. And it also frequently happens in a structure where you have like the pawns on dark squares and you can play bishop f1 and bishop a6. Keep doing that. Dang it. So anyway, um, so the rook's not necessarily well placed here, although it is pretty active. It's just also vulnerable. And here comes bishop c3. Makes sense. And here it looks like Duda sacked an exchange. That's interesting. It makes sense. This seems like it's pretty much forced after um, bishop takes b2. I'm just going to jump back there for a second. I think if, if they don't play a move like rook b1, they're just going to lose either one or both of the queenside pawns. They would have to get some kind of crazy kingside initiative to justify that. So it doesn't seem right. So I think this sequence is all pretty much forced. Rook b8 is a good move, because I think even though white will technically be sacking an exchange after like bishop a5, the weakness of their dark squares will definitely be felt long term. Um, we're even already looking at some kind of initiative type moves like e4 could happen. And also knight g5, just to try to get the bishop pair attack, maybe win the exchange back. Um, I don't know if this is the most accurate assessment, but I think rook b8 is pretty strong because we don't necessarily want to take the rook yet, and we don't have to. The only thing I would be concerned about playing a move like rook b8 is whether or not they can play rook a6 successfully. But it's pretty plain to see that after rook a6, you just play queen takes c5. So that's not really coming up. So black's playing very actively. They got their minor pieces all on pretty good squares. The white heavy pieces look kind of awkward. I really do like black's position here, even if it is like equal or something. Okay, so after d4, this bishop has been made temporarily bad, so probably now's a good time to cash in. They also are defending uh, the bishop preparing rook a6, so it's probably necessary just to avoid losing the a-pawn. And now in, in an ironic twist of fate, the, the black rook is the one that's getting on b2. So all white's trouble happened from putting their rook on b7. But now black can successfully put their rook on b2. It's kind of funny. Probably this is still prep, because the line has been pretty much forced so far. Um, but what do I know? My prep ends at, like, move 5. Anyway, so they played e4. At least gaining some center control. But the center pawns can also become weak like this, so we'll see how good it is. Knight d6 is kind of necessary. Because if they play a move such as knight g7, this bishop takes e7. And then the, the dark squares are going to be really weak, especially without that 
dark square bishop. So knight d6 is like an only move. And here, um, one move that might come to mind is e5, but I think this just runs into knight b7. And there will be no um, glorious future with the bishop taking on e7, because it's just going to go away immediately. The only way they could maybe prevent or forestall that is with queen c3, but that provokes rook takes a2. And um, now the bishop's pinned, so they still can't play queen, queen uh, bishop e7, so... So queen a3. I feel like black has a great position, but somehow Duda managed to win this game. So I'm curious to see what kind of mistakes occurred. This is like the first part where white is getting active too. So probably black blundered somewhere around here. I'm not sure. I think white's going to play h4, h5 at some point. It, it looks good. Queen d7 is a little bit passive, but there's also maybe the possibility of Queen b5 or queen a4. I think queen b5 is not good though because it, it provokes bishop f1. I wonder if maybe queen a8. No, queen a is just too crazy. Like there's nothing concrete to justify putting the queen on the line of the bishop. So queen d7, okay, seems fine. I think I would have preferred queen b7 since they also cannot activate their knight so easily. Maybe queen b7 followed by queen b2. To try to put some pressure. But I don't know how real it is. I just think this would be better than queen d7. Queen d7 is a little suspicious. Like, since since white probably wants to play h4, h5 anyway. To try to open the h-file, or at least jeopardize the king's structure. I don't think it's reasonable to try to maintain pressure on h3. Um, for example, let's say white plays h4 right now. And you play bishop e6. I'm sorry, bishop h3. This might even be, like, tactically worse. Because of, like, bishop d6 or or maybe... Oh, queen b3 is already there. So it's just not that reasonable to move the bishop in the first place, but... Okay, let's pretend that we, we prepare it a little bit. They play h4, we play king g7, we play h5. We don't want to take it because our king would get just too exposed after, like, knight h4. So maybe now's the time where we try h3. They take and take and maybe take on g6. It looks like black is getting some initiative, but I'm not convinced. These positions are usually quite concrete. Maybe e5, queen f4, no way. Probably bishop d6. Rook h8 looks dangerous. But I have a feeling that there should be some kind of simple defense here. I'm still looking for it, though. Oh, yeah, knight h4. Looks very reasonable. And um, if they try to take on d6 now, I think that rook c7 is coming in real fast. So this whole plan seems like it's failing because the bishop is needed to guard the light squares. That's probably the best way of summarizing my, my thesis and demonstrating this not-so-forced line. Anyway... So they play d5, which actually forces the bishop to do something. Um, this also closes off the possibility of queen b3 somewhat. So I'm not sure if this move's good for white or for black. Hmm. Well, I do feel like it's awkward that this bishop is getting chased away. So probably it's better for white. But I thought the position was better for black like just a short time ago. So let's just scroll back and see. Where was it better for black? All right, right here was better for black. So maybe this move f6 was objectionable, but the bishop is kind of getting trapped too. And knight e5 was coming up. So f6, okay, maybe f6 isn't so bad. It also might be necessary to have rook f7 to guard the dark squares at some point. I don't know. I think probably queen b7 was like the only move to play here. Although I'm not sure if it changes anything. Alright, so in the game they play queen d7 and d5. Now here if they play d5, we can play bishop d7. That's what I thought was better. But yeah, the queen on d7 just blocks the bishop. There's no reason to do it. I think this is a big improvement over the game. But um, that's just me. I have a little bit of experience playing the structure for black. And um, 
I usually find it quite comfortable as long as I don't get rolled off the board. Which usually happens when your pieces don't have a lot of uh, happy places to go. Alright, so here they try bishop h3, and um, the game notes are giving uh, bishop takes h3 an exclamation point, which makes sense because, I don't know, I already explained why. It just goes in line with what white wants to do. In fact, this might be an even better version, since with d5 in play, even though white doesn't have queen b3, queen b3 would have been a double attack if the pawn was not on d5. However, their compensation is that this knight is going to be really awesome on e6, where it attacks all the important dark squares, the ones that have been weak for so long. So rook c8 happened, and instead of playing knight c6, that's cool. Oh, I heard a dinging noise. Omar Novello 04 gave a follow. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support. So knight c6 happened here. Um, this looks really good also, because it's just stopping the rook from getting active ever. Maybe it's even better than on e6. I might have uh, wrongly estimated that e6 was stronger just because it attacks near the king. This also participates with knight e7. So, so they were forced to stop knight e7. Then he went back. Hmm. That's suspicious. Well, it's move 31. Maybe they were just trying to get close to a uh, time control or something. I don't remember what the time control is for World Cup. And this was in the early round, so I think it might have been a classical time control. So, could be. Alright, now here they played rook b1 instead. I wonder why he didn't like just keeping the knight on c6. Here, black is kind of threatening f5, I suppose. And if the queen goes too far afield, it might run into, like, rook takes f2 stuff. This just occurred to me. Maybe there's a repetition after rook. And maybe f5 here. Actually, yeah, I feel like this is really good for black, even though they're down a piece. The initiative is just too strong. There's no way that they can, like, lose this game now. So queen b3 or some similar move is not good. They'd probably have to stay on one of these if they want to do anything active. I don't know. I'm not that impressed by knight c6. Now, it, it looks good initially because it forces rook e8, but rook e8 also looks like it was a useful move. So I think probably they had buyer's regret immediately afterwards. But here, I wonder if f5 is possible. Maybe they were trying to... Play a little bit of psychology here, trying to provoke f5. We can't take it, obviously, because the queen is hanging. But knight e6 now will be even stronger, because the king side is even more weakened by the f5 move. I think this is probably it. Probably he wanted to go to knight c6, because he knew he could come back and go to e6 anyway, and he wanted to try to provoke black into playing f5 to weaken their king. Um, that sounds pretty reasonable. But anything sounds reasonable if you use nice words, so who knows? Maybe I'll have to go ask Mr. Duda. Okay, so the rook's off the second rank. Seems like black is backpedaling here. I like the pressure on f2. It seemed like it was really important. But could they have improved differently? Their queen seems a little misplaced, even though it helps with... Um, the queen takes h2 idea. Maybe it would have been better to just go for a queenside takeover. Like maneuver the queen either via g4 or d7. g4 seems too blocked. Like these squares are all under control. So probably it would just be like queen d7 in order to play queen a4. And maybe they could just trade one pair of rooks. Like that. And then activate this last rook. And maybe with less material on the board, uh, the exchange will matter even more. Usually if you're up in exchange, you should trade um, one pair of rooks. That usually increases the strength of the remaining rook. Okay, so they play knight e6. Queen a7 is a major threat now. Before, queen a7 was just preparing knight e6, and it would still leave room for um, defense, but now it looks quite dangerous. I think the only reason they didn't play queen a7 now is because black sneakily prepared rook c4. 
should lead to me. Yeah, I shouldn't say I think. I, I definitely know that because it's a forced win for black after that. Anyway, so queen a7 is out for now, hence rook e1, which makes it so rook c1 is not checked. Now, um, okay, they broke with e5. I was, I was thinking after g5 they might try queen a7 here, but this allows queen h6. e5 looks much stronger, just generally opening the position. Now there's this pass pawn problem. I like the way that white sacrificed this e pawn in order to um, become more active than before. Probably I would have played queen a7, tried to tie down the queen, and then look for something like e5, but I think e5 is way better than that. It also takes advantage of the fact that they cannot, in this move order, play f takes e5. If you play um, queen a7 first, what did I do wrong? Yeah, if you play queen a7 first, when they play queen a6, if you play e5, they can just play f takes e5. Black is winning because now white has no break. Anyway, so this is how the game ended in fire. This g4 move, it's like almost winning for black, but white can play h4 and just sack one pawn to create an umbrella. This is the umbrella for the king, keeping him safe from attack. And after queen g6, it's just game over. It's too easy. Um, it looks like they resigned here, because after king f7, there's queen f8, me. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, the knight is hanging, my bad. Probably something like d7. This should lead to a mate pretty soon. Like, they take this, get another queen, looks too good. Alright, no no quick mates though, because the knight isn't protected. Anyway, so that was the first game it looks like, a lead. And um, this one, Shung has white. And we're seeing some bishop game stuff. Probably it's going to just transpose to the Italian. Oh, no, they played c6. I thought that they would play something like um, bishop c5, knight c3, knight c6, knight f3, transposing to the Italian. But no, c6 is different. It's unique. Maybe I should learn these lines. It might be worth uh, checking it out. So it looks like they're just preparing d5, so I'm expecting d5 now. Yeah, makes sense. Bishop b4 check is surprising to me. Because um, usually a move like c3 is just peachy. It's even in line with what white wants to do, generally. So black is giving a free move, and I'm wondering why. Why would someone want to provoke c3 in this particular structure? I don't think it's really important that the knight go on c3. Usually you provoke a pawn move so that the square is blocked. This is an odd line. All right, I'm going to have to do some research on this because I don't think I'm going to figure it out sitting in front of you guys. Um, so bishop d2, reasonable. Maybe they're just both good. And um, Shung's choice was bishop d2. Could happen. But this also looks like an exchange of bad bishop for good bishop a little bit. Because after this, black could fix all their pawns on dark squares. And then this bishop will be pretty cool. Well, this bishop is a little bit stunted, but still objectively active. Um, okay, so queen g5, knight d7. There's a pawn hanging here, but it's a poison pawn. Because after rook g8... Queen h6. I think rook g6 is probably good. Although I, I think it, it could also just be rook takes g2. The queen looks kind of awkwardly placed here. One thing I would like to do as black is play a move like, let's say they play king f1 to try to drive down the rook. It would be ironic because it leads to this winning double. Rook takes f2. Since after rook takes f2, knight takes e4. 
I think knight e4 is the best. No, I think knight g4 is better because they can't take this knight even if they want to. After like king takes three, knight takes h6, the queen is lost because of this discover attack. Even knight e4 is winning because the queen can take. It doesn't have to be a double attack with a knight. It could also just be a direct capture. So tactics are happening after queen g7, hence pawn takes d5 and d4. It makes sense that white would want to fix the d pawn as a target long term. So I think this strategy works out pretty well. In my experience, a, a system uh, of moves that locks the center and also lands a knight on an outpost square almost always gives some kind of dynamic compensation, even if you lose the pawn. So looks like a good version here for white. Maybe um, the secret for why they didn't play c3 earlier lies in this move. This move is really strong now because it puts pressure on the fixed pawn. It could be that this kind of structure is inevitable in this system and that uh, pawn to c3 would actually make it impossible. So I'll have to go check out that line on my own time and see if that's true. All right, so knight b6, activating some pieces. f3 with the king in the center. What a bold decision. I guess it makes sense as long as you don't get kind of late castling. Like when they play rook e8, you probably have to castle at that very moment. Because with this knight pinned, it's not going to be pretty. Here they play bishop e6. I thought that they would play um, something like pawn takes f3. And probably we'd see a recapture. I'd use the pawn so this knight still can't land on a good square. And then after rook e8... Oh, actually, you know what? It makes perfect sense now. Of course we shouldn't take on f3. Because if we start playing some active chess, like, um... Alright, let's say bishop h3. Even though that looks a little dangerous. Bishop's hanging. Um, white was never playing the castle kingside. They just play queenside castling. And even though these pawns can start running down, like, maybe they'll play a5 here. We're immediately creating mating threats, so it, it all makes perfect sense. So, Bishop e6 is probably only a novelty because this position hasn't been reached many times. It's probably not because there's some kind of amazing idea behind it. Alright, so castling occurred. Makes sense. We want to play like h4, h5 again. Queen d2. Queen d2 seems a little passive, but it also makes sense to prevent any kind of exchange sacrifice. I think if white played h4 here, we'd see rook c3. And then at the very least, something like maybe activate the rook first. It looks uncomfortable, even if there is some compensation. So preventing that makes sense. There might even be something more concrete that I'm not seeing. Alright, a6. Why a6? I guess just to prevent knight b5. Maybe to prepare b5. We'll see. It's interesting that um, white backed out of this kingside attack that looked kind of ready to go. And is now focusing on the center. It might be kind of like they're going to focus on the center until they can clear this line somehow. And then switch back. It could also just be that the king side attack is a, is a phantom. Because even though the queen is already well positioned. And it's possible that you could maybe force them to oops, to capture here. It also seems like a pipe dream. It's not really coming together concretely. So the, the, the pressure on the center seems real though. Alright, so they had to take. Now maybe white will switch back. Yeah, this looks like the king side attack I was expecting. All right, so here they, they play bishop f7. The reason is that um, if they play something like, what's a reasonable move that that's also a blunder? Um, if they play like rook c6, then there's rook takes e6. The reason is that after queen takes e6, there's bishop takes d5. Oh, wait, no, the knight's guarding it. I think pro probably they would first play knight f4. And then maybe capture with this knight. 
or something similar. The threat of knight e7 and knight f6 is pretty strong, but they also can't exactly just counter. There's another knight. So tactics, rook takes e6 is an idea, so they had to avoid that. Xiong offers a trade of queens. All right, I think I'm just wrong again and again concerning this uh, kingside attack. It seems like it's just never going to crystallize. Um, it, it also kind of makes sense that it shouldn't. White doesn't have a majority of pieces near the king, so... Probably they're cruising for some kind of heavy piece endgame, like just rooks. And they'll just hammer the g-pawn. Because the 2 versus 3 shouldn't be winning for black. Knight c5 is a nice active move. They can't take it because of the double attack. So rook b8 guarding b7. What's going on here? Rook on the 7th looks very good. If they play king f7, I'm sorry, king f8, probably they would play rook d e1. This rook almost looks trapped also, so I'm suspicious. Alright, so probably they would just play rook d e1 and then prepare something cool. Oh, they actually played king f8 in the game. My bad, I didn't really notice. If they play something else instead of king f8 to try to challenge this rook, I don't know, maybe they would play like rook e8. I think the problem here is that after we take, there's now a pin on the d-pawn. They could put this knight on e4 maybe. They'd have to play rook c6. Yeah, this seems just too complicated. We should just take the pawn. So the rook has to stay. I wonder if there's another way of getting rid of the rook. Like maybe knight c8. But then the knight on d7 hangs. Yeah, I think king f8 is like an only move here. It's kind of interesting. Alright, then knight c5 happened. But that seems crazy. How can you play knight c5 here? You're just losing two minor pieces for a rook after, after this sequence. Maybe they're just forced to do it because white has so much pressure. But I think I would probably try to hold on and do something different. I wish there were timestamps in these chess base uh, game files. Okay, king g6 looks bad because now the king is so far away from the queenside majority that's running. Alright, so let's just quickly see this Grandmaster technique. Wow, bishop is so active here on e8. The rooks are like useless now. I I did this kind of formation one time in a recent game of mine, and I thought it was very effective to create this kind of barrier so that all these files are inaccessible to the rooks. And it's kind of nice to see a strong player doing the same thing. All right. And then they resigned here. I think after king f5, it's just hopeless. It's not like a mate, but it's just depressing to play. Okay, so the score was even. Okay, and this one's a rapid tie break. So let's go through it rapidly. Oh yeah, my friend Luis told me about this. He's on the stream sometimes. Um, not in a while though. But after knight takes e4, bishop d3, we're playing some kind of classical um, Russian game here. Um, from what I understand, knight takes e5 is a considerably better move than d takes e5. Although I, I've played both and I'm not sure what the difference is anymore. I kind of just don't remember. I think the e5 pawn gets weak if you take too soon. And also, if you take with the knight, they can't ever play bishop g4, which is one of the central ideas for black in this structure. Okay, so... Rapid development, good pawn structure. Looks very equal, but white has a small initiative just because they went first. Okay. 
I like how white takes over the e-file so quickly. I thought here they would play like um, queen takes e3, but I guess after like king takes king of runs into a chip. Um, they would clearly play rook takes f8. But I think the problem is that if white tries to do something very active, they have to guard the c pawn anyway. So it's maybe just too much liquidation. So they're attacking on b7 with the rook and not the queen. I guess that makes some sense. You might want to attack with the lower priority pieces in general. So if you have a choice, use the rook instead of the queen. This is an interesting decision. I'll be very hesitant. I'd probably take a long time to calculate the consequences of queen d3. But m maybe uh, Xiong has actually studied this particular position before since it looks so basic. Um, you get doubled pawns. But as I've often said to people who want to learn some rook end games, the, the pieces don't really matter that much in a rook end game. All that matters is how active they are. So... Doubled pawns, it's kind of like two weaker pawns, but at the same time, it also means an open file for white, a half open file for white, control of several critical squares. It's going to be pretty hard for black to attack these pawns and to get their king active. Um, the downside, though, is that the king cannot also go through these pawns. Oops. So they're, they're in the way for both sides, kind of. All right, this position looks pretty equal, but white's on the better side of equality. It feels like white has a material advantage. Four, six, two, four, six. Yeah, it's just equal. Equal count. But um, I find it interesting that black is having a hard time getting the pawns to safety. Like, they moved their backward B pawn, but now they have this weak C pawns, so they're just going to lose that pawn. Probably if they wanted to defend, they would have to just play extremely passively. Just never move the rook, try to keep the king from getting in, and try to just like check the king away whenever it arrives on like e6, something like that. But it's not so simple to do. Like, this end game is prob probably winning for white already. The only reason I'm questioning it is that white's king cannot easily get active. But almost always this formation is a good sign in the rook and pawn end games, in my experience. Alright, so he's probably going to bring the king around. Now that the a pawn is rolling, it looks very dangerous. I like this um, this technique here how they played a6 and then instead of pushing a7 to try to promote the pawn they just found a way of moving the rook and protecting it from the side so now um they can safely transition this to like probably two pawns versus zero they're gonna just take these pawns so that's my guess about what's going to happen in this game all right so it ended up being these two pawns against zero which is even better Again, in my experience, I think that the farther the pawns are apart, as long as they're protectable, um, or defensible rather, it's usually just good for white. And Xiong won the game here. I'm not sure if it was a flag or resignation. Probably it was a resignation. This position looks very bad. And um, I have a live book open here. It says that, that it's mate in like 26 at the most or something like that. Anyway, so that was the first tiebreak game, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And Duda made a comeback in this one by playing a3. It's always nice to see um, the top players playing this kind of provocative chess. Um, because it, it kind of makes it painfully obvious that the, the state of opening theory is such that um, if you are well prepared enough, you can even play some of the, the not so good lines. Which is ironically a consequence of having computer technology to prepare with. Probably in the past, it would never be practical to study A3 extensively. But 
now that computers kind of lift the load from the players a little bit, um, you know, you can explore the options more efficiently to justify playing such a wild move. Usually when people play A3, it's to transpose to another closed system where the A3 move is useful in preventing either knight B4 or bishop B4. Or where it makes a space for this bishop. These are some common reasons to play A3. And um, it's starting to look like that's the case. Um... I was going to say, I think white will play something like f4, but at the same time, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to play f4 on second thought. Probably they're going to go for something like, I don't know, they'll just play kingside castling and try to take over space in the center. Okay, so it looked like here they were trying for an early flank attack, like if black castles here. Probably they would play something like bishop h6. And after some other pedestrian moves, they would play like h4. I think bishop a2 is most precise here, but can't say for sure. And here, after a move like h5, I think that white would be just winning. So this would be one common plan for white here. I think this is kind of why black played h6. Um, just to illustrate the concept, after knight takes h5, which looks safe, there's rook h5. And a checkmate comes up. There's no way to guard g7. So that's probably why h6 was played and not something like castling. And um, bishop h4 is a normal move. That's good. Um, I kind of get a good feeling for black's position here. But usually when people play an odd first move, the less sharply you play, the less likely you are to be able to punish their um, so-called inaccurate move. So I think knight d4, allowing a liquidation of the pieces, is a step in the wrong direction. Probably here, um, black should go in for some kind of space-grabbing operation on the queen side. Maybe try to break with b4, something to take advantage of the a3 move itself. Um, but what do I know? I'm not exactly a super GM. I'm just the host here at Chess Players Made Better. Alright, so 92. This D pawn looks kind of weak. So I think white has already equalized and might be better. Yeah, I always like playing white against this kind of pawn structure. This seems kind of foolish. Like almost a beginner mistake to put this pawn on D4. But, again, maybe there's some concrete reason that I, I just don't see. I would say that provoking a4 is useful, but I don't see how the knight is going to ever get on b4. Usually that's how you punish this uh, holiness. And probably f4 now. Yeah, I've played this structure against a similar thing. I'm going to scroll back and just show you guys. Um, one common opening trap that people try especially beginners. This is knight d4 thing. The idea is that after knight takes e5, g5 wins on the spot because of this deadly attack on the king with queen g2 plus the hanging knight. Um, a common way that the game could end is with like knight f7, g2, rook f1, queen e4, e2, and the knight f3 checkmate. I've even seen this similar kind of game happen at nationals. Scholastic Nationals, so it happens a lot. But my my point is that the refutation is just knight takes d4, which establishes that same structure like what we have in the, the game that we're looking at. And a common plan that was put forward by, I guess, Kasparov was that if they play um, the most common moves, like d6 or bishop c5, um, first off, you can play queen h5 just to provoke some weakness. You might even win the pawn right away. Like I think a common way that things go here is like so that's a major threat. And but that's too concrete. I 
I mean to show that even if you don't play something as concrete as what Kasparov recommended here, like if you just castle, this position is also better for white because of the simple plan to play like, um, let's say they play bishop e6, knight d2, and f4. It's the same plan, just on move 16 of this this game that we've seen. And since this is something well known in beginner chess, I feel surprised that um, black is kind of permitting the same strategies to be used by white. And it doesn't surprise me that, that the result is what it is, given how they played. Um, so the e5 break is coming in. It's kind of wild chess, but the knight, I mean, it's getting trapped a little bit. Yeah, and here comes a tactical bluff. Kind of expected. When I saw white playing e5, it's kind of a, a showstopper move. After king takes f7, there's bishop takes d4. Since it's check, they can't even capture this with check. So it's just game over. So king d7 was necessary, and now it looks a little bit king hunty. So knight f4 looks good, preparing bishop e6. If they, if they take this, it just activates the white pieces even more. And this knight is never coming home. It's a sad fate for that one. So here bishop e6 happens. The king is running wild. Knight g6. Now white's going to have even like material compensation for uh, sacrificing their queenside pawns. Yeah, this initiative is too strong. Let's just see the last moves to see how it ended. Because I don't think it's going to be very interesting. For very long. Yeah, we're looking at a winning end game. So this knight is trapped on the edge. The pawn has to support it, so the pawn can never really advance to a2. So probably uh, the recipe is something like provoking them to play a2. So then most probably bishop c5, and that's what was played. Yeah. And um, here they didn't take on a3 immediately. I think the reason is that there's some tactic here. Yeah, the tactic is knight e3, winning back the g-pawn. So they play g4, prophylaxis against that active play. And this is a just kind of winning double attack. The knight's trapped totally. Alright, and they resigned here. So that was interesting. So, so next they went to maybe an even faster time control, I think. I'm not certain. Like I said, I should be keeping a little bit better track of this World Cup stuff, but what can you do? All right, so this Karl Khan line, the E5 variation has been pretty popular in the last like three or four years. I don't really play it much myself, but I can see why they, they like it. For instance, um, one really impressive game for me was Caruana versus Bereave. Or Bareev, I think is how you pronounce his name, um, from the Olympiad in, I guess, 2016. I think I said Caruana, right? Yeah. So Caruana played very well with white. Um, he just pushed Bareev off the board with space on the queen side, the king side, and in the center. Eventually, the, the e pawn was passed, and it was kind of elegant. You know, you play e5, you play e4, e5 in your first two moves, and then you finish the game with e6, e7. Kind of nice to see. All right, so bishop e3. That's a pretty uncommon move. Usually in this position, people play like knight f3 or h4 or knight c3 or knight d2. Um, I don't think they really ever play like c4 or bishop d3. Bishop d3 is kind of a pathetic move because after this exchange, it's just, the structure is pretty favorable for black. Games here is black when I knew that my opponent chose the bishop d3 line. Um, the chief reason being that um, I have no bad bishop, right? My pawns are on dark and there's no no dark square bishop to be found. This bishop's good, even though it's restrained by um, white dark colored pawns. But these pawns are having a more detrimental effect on this bishop than on my bishop, so definitely equal. So bishop e3, not unreasonable, but also uncommon. Maybe it's just a move order finesse and 
I just don't know about it because I'm not that aware of the Karo Khan theory. Now, since c3 is not one of the common early moves, um, I'm a little suspicious of it here. It's kind of like they're preparing for a French, but ahead by one move. And also with the bishop outside. So I kind of feel like they're choosing maybe the wrong plan. But again, what do I know? So f4, h5 is interesting. Some swashbuckling chess. Knight f3, h4. It's maybe a little bit early to be playing h5, h4. But if I remember correctly, Bereev also did this against Caruana. So it might be like a normal normal plan in the Karo Khan to just obtain a little bit more space on the king side. Some maneuvering room for your pieces. And um, it also makes sense if you want to put the knight on f5 to play h4. Yeah, it actually, it all makes perfect sense now. If you put the knight on f4, on f5, you don't want to see g4. So if you play h4, you could always take the, the g4 pawn on Poisson. So it kind of helps you to establish that big knight. Alright, so simple development. But this pawn is kind of tender. At least going into the end game, it will be. Probably Black's going to try to castle queenside. I seem to recollect um, Caruana also played knight b3, so it's a very similar game. Maybe I should um, find it, and maybe I'll maybe I'll make a video about it at some point. Okay, so finally Black was able to trade off these bishops, which is usually good. But it's also kind of like, do you have a plan? Alright, it looks like the plan was to play g5. So that's actually pretty cool. I'm not sure if it's good or not, but it's sharp. And it's consistent with the idea of castling queenside, which is what I was thinking. Probably if um, they're going to entice white into capturing on g5. Yeah, that happened here. And if they can castle queenside, they can bring this rook over and try to attack this guy. Um, the unlucky thing is that when you've wrecked your king side, you've kind of declared where your king is going to live, so white can confidently attack on the queen side, or in the center, or both. Okay, so now here's the first really big threat that I was able to discern, and it's rook takes f5. So probably, yeah, queen g5 makes a lot of sense. Because we don't want to back off on having this bishop like a bone in white's throat. Um, and activating the pieces makes sense. Alright, so finally the long castling. Black is definitely better. I'm really surprised that Duda won this game. Alright, so b4. Or g7 initiative. Rook a2. Rook h8 initiative. This looks very strong for black. f6 to destroy the center as a way of getting this knight involved, maybe. I think the only way that black could lose this is if they, like, lose the pawn storm race. But they captured on b5, which is important. For example, if they play, like, h3, even though h3 is an interesting move, this square is guarded enough times, right? So if they take on c6, I think probably it's really more chances for one side. Oh, there's maybe a tactic lurking in this position. I was thinking queen takes g2, rook takes g2. But I also see knight g3 maybe, or rook takes h2, something like that. No, I think this is probably just like... The attack is ongoing. Like if they take on g5, that's probably not so great because it's threat of g1. But it's defensible. And uh, there's also this issue with defending the c6 pawn. So I like c takes b5. I think this is um, a better idea for black than just allowing white to capture on c6. And destroying the center also feels good vacating the, the rook, I mean the bishop from its vulnerable square also feels right. I don't see how this could all be wrong. 
The only thing is that maybe it's just not testing enough. Maybe there's some way of breaking through. Because they're temporarily not um, attacking the king. So it's giving white time to regroup. Usually when I have some attack pending, I try to calculate and find a, um, a winning blow. And if it's not there, then I play like this. But maybe that's maybe that's what happened here for Xiong, even though his position is much better. Knight b3, white is able to regroup. So probably we have to go back here. And bishop b6 is a passive move. Like, it looks good, but it's not enough of an attacking move. I want to be able to arrange knight g3 and do something to open this h file. So in the game notes, I see rook f7 is suggested. And I think the idea is to play knight g3. For example, um, if now they play knight b3, knight g3 happens on the spot. Because they're forced to capture, and this should lead to a check immediately. So, I guess they would have to play h3, which is very awkward to do. And then they can switch to attack on the f file. I think this is probably the best line of play. Um, granted, it's also in the game notes, so it's easier for me to find it than it is for someone to find it in a real game. So, um, not dissing anybody for how they played under pressure in a probably a rapid game. All right, knight f4 is a blunder. They played rook e8 here, but I thought knight g3 like they take. And after this, I wouldn't take with the queen because we need to cover g2. I would and this should be lights out. Even g2 is actually no g2 is not check me. But I'll just take the queen. Actually, maybe g2 does lead to a mate. So they have to take. And then we can take this one. Looks a little checkmate-y. Yeah, I get a very good feeling for white's... I'm sorry, for black's position after knight g3. So rook e8, inexplicable. Maybe it's just a time pressure thing. Um, so, yeah, actually, all these moves are looking suspicious, like c4. Not sure what purpose it serves. I thought they would play, like, knight d4. Or something similar. Maybe bishop f2. Bishop f2 is probably the best to, to get rid of all the pressure. Without this bishop, there's not going to be a checkmate, because the king can just walk away. So, c4 is suspicious. Do you take c4 seems also suspicious, because they can capture with check. But then the queen was busy here. Yeah, this position is like very complicated to play in time pressure. I think, though, that since the queen is busy guarding some things, like guarding against h3, for instance, guarding against knight g3, it might be good to try this. So that if they take, we can play rook g1 checkmate with queen. The only thing I would look out for here if I was calculating this is some kind of desperado tactic, but I don't see it. And just to illustrate the idea. So, but hey, maybe they, they couldn't find all this stuff in the, the time scramble. That's part of why I don't really like the idea of switching chess to um, faster time controls, which seems to be a very popular idea now. On one hand, it's nice because it requires people to... Um, prepare chess in a more systematic and aggressive way at home, so they're going to be stronger under pressure. But at the same time, I think it will take away some of the the art of the game, all these just back and forth blunders. Anyway, so King C8, it looks like Black has lost the thread here by allowing Bishop A7 check. So Queen C4 happens, and after they just save the rook and stop the checkmate threats. Um, I think probably black resigned here. Yeah, they play bishop takes c5 and then resign. Sad ending. Black played um, like very well at the beginning. When the time pressure came in, he, he kind of dropped the ball. And I think that this might be the last tiebreak game. All right, so they played a different but still classical 
move order for this uh, Russian game Petrov defense thing. And reached a similar position, I guess. No, not really. In the last game, um, they reached a an end game that had all the long range pieces remaining. And here, there's still a lot of potential for what to do with the knights. So, c5 trying to destroy white center makes sense. Bishop g4 pressuring white center. In the other game, they played knight to e5, preventing this thing. So it's kind of let's see how how it played out allowing bishop g4. So he played h3 immediately, which kind of signifies that there's nothing wrong with giving it a try. But this is also a 10 plus 10 game. Um, so maybe he feels more confident playing some weird lines with uh, less time for both sides. So knight d7, I guess preparing a 5. Or maybe preparing to go to c5. It could just be like a general good maneuver also to go on a5. I'm sorry, e5. So knight a6 happened, bishop f4, knight c7. Okay, that's interesting. So they're preparing b5. It, it makes some sense because this is kind of like a Benoni style position where white just has like a slightly more jeopardized king and black has managed to find a, a home for their bishops. I think you call it like an old Benoni, this kind of structure. All right. I like how they played f takes g6 here, activating the rook. It makes a lot of sense given how um, the pawn has left g2, so it's no longer guarding the knight. So lots of pressure is building. Well, knight e5. I did not expect knight e5. What's the purpose? I think the purpose is just to get this deep pawn rolling, but like, what if they just take it? I think this looks... It's like a normal position. Probably they have to just give up one piece. So they would choose maybe bishop f6. I don't feel like this is a very major test. Knight e5 is kind of an odd move. Alright, so in the game they played deep, they played these moves. I didn't realize. And he gave up the bishop instead of the knight. That's an interesting choice. I guess it's because the bishop's a bad bishop. And the position's kind of closed a little bit, so the knights are more effective. So I could I could agree with that as a statement. Maybe I would have chosen my knight over my bishop as well. And white doesn't even have two bishops, so there's no risk of entering like a bishop pair end game or something. Okay, so both sides have activated their pieces, but I, I like black maybe a little better here. Because after knight f4, I do feel like there's a lot of pressure on this f-file. The h3, g4 thing that white did is suspicious. But given the result of the game, a win for white, it seems like um, he just didn't crack under pressure. Also, it might be that the structure is more dangerous when the bishop is not on g3. So probably since he was able to arrange that transformation, it was a little bit more kosher to play h3 and g4. Okay, so white's probing the queen side, but black isn't making any weaknesses. Um, in the version of this game that I have on my computer, it only tells how long they had to make the move, not how much time is remaining. So it's hard for me to assess what the, the time situation is. But they haven't... Only a couple of times white and white has spent like 30 seconds or one minute on a move. So I think the situation is that white is lower on time by about like two minutes, but neither of them have really spent a lot in this 10 plus 10. All right, so drop the e-pawn, but black gets some, some more activity for their queen. Okay, so they're targeting c2, it looks like. Knight e4 looks like an active way of um, guarding the c2 square, but it also temporarily cuts off the power of this rook, which I find suspicious. All right, so rook c7 guards the c-pawn. Makes sense. Now I, feel like, now I feel like white is better. 
So where did Black lose the thread? Probably it was by losing the epon. So is this move um, queen c7 maybe? But I think the reason they did it is that the epon is kind of hanging anyway. Like they would move their knight somewhere. The c pawn's also hanging. All right, so maybe it was at this point. Maybe they should have sacrificed the a7 pawn in order to avoid losing the e pawn and the c pawn. But it could also just be too late. I'm actually not sure where they drifted away. It could be that the dark square bishop is missed. Maybe they picked the wrong minor piece in uh, this position. They um, they played knight d5 instead of maybe saving the bishop. This could have been a better choice. Because here at least the queen isn't oddly placed. It can support these pawns. All of them. So it was probably more concrete than... We made it out to be the wrong time to make a general decision. So the pawns ended up being weak. And I think the plot line here is that white is just out playing black. All right, so we have a queen and knight endgame. I think queen and knight endgames are kind of similar to like queen and bishop endgames where the initiative matters a lot and king safety is the most important of all. So queen e5, it looks like white's better. The queen has a dominating position. And um, with this offer of a queen trade, it seems that black is assessing this position um, and rightly so is better for black because, well, Knight end games, you can usually assess them similar to the analogous position without knights. And if we look at this as a pure king and pawn end game, um, black's king is much more active than white's king. So if these pieces just come off, the king's going to probably march over to where's the weakest point that we can attack. Probably they'll try to come to like d4. And it would take white. All right, so it's one, two, three, four moves. It would be like one, two. All right, so they get their one move early. It would look something like this. Oh, and another thing here is that probably black is stealing a move. Because if white doesn't play something like c3, then I think knight b4 will be too late, and that should be significant. So I think their assessment of the knight and pawn endgame was correct. So queen d5 is a... Good move. But objectively, white's queen is just still superior. There's still lots of weak pawns. And here, um, they might just have to enter the the knight endgame after all because of the mate threat on g7. So here it goes. The knight endgame occurs. Black has a lot of queenside space. And that can sometimes turn into a liability because of um, the fact that the king might get there first and start munching on the pawns. But since black's king is more active here as well, I don't think that's the case. All right, so c3 happened for the same reason I mentioned before, that we should prevent this kind of double attack. And um, black has doubled pawns, which are usually considered weak. But knights are also especially vulnerable against rook pawns. And since there's two of them, I don't think that's necessarily going to pan out very well for, for white. In fact, here, black isn't even making any effort to like close the position and make white try to work for the pawns like you would with a pawn race. They're just kind of saying, all right, you can have my g-pawn, you can push your h-pawn. I'm going to get there first. But I think this is also not totally correct because... White has this h-pawn running, so it's going to happen one, two, three, four, five moves, right? It's a rook pawn, so this knight is also not going to easily stop it with any number of tricks. And at the same time, black has to somehow eliminate this pawn, and how can they even do that? Probably they have to play knight takes c3 to deflect it. I mean, it's, it's pretty concrete. After b takes c3, things are probably because we're both going to queen a3 and 
Well, actually, the White Knight can stop this pawn, right? Someone whose username is probably unpronounceable, XDEH, Jade, perhaps, give a follow. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so after h4, it's hard for me to see exactly how this is going to be. I think the crux of this is that after king c3, they're threatening to promote themselves. The best that white can do is... Actually, no, they should play knight a1. My, my mistake. After king c3, knight a1. King b2. They're just barely making when they move their king. We both get queens, and there should be a repetition. If I take this, obviously obviously it's losing, but this should be a, a repetition. So that's pretty close. But it's also just not logical to capture the knight on c3. Like, obviously our, our winning effort involves pushing the h-pawn, so after knight c3, black rightly declared that this would be a good plan, but they're just too slow. So I thought black was maybe better, and then things kind of turned the other way now. Here comes that queen for white. And then the classic zigzagging technique to create mating threats. And that's it. Um, after king a2, they will play queen c2. Um, but let's go back just a little bit and examine this a little more. I did get the feeling black was better, probably like... Maybe here, after b5. I think taking on f4 was a mistake. I think what they should have done was accept these doubled pawns just to prevent white from having much of a possibility of getting h4. So probably the best move here is like knight c6, which would provoke c3. And after king e7, we get something quite similar to what I had analyzed just previously. So black went wrong at this critical moment, probably in time pressure. Um, and so Xiang was able to carry the day. Let me see, was this the last one? No, they played two more, actually. They played one draw. Um, I'm not sure if it was a fighting draw. They're tied up. This is a five plus three. So it was another Karo Khan advance. But this one fizzled out to a draw. So let's just go a little bit quickly. Pretty uh, standard stuff here. I think this is kind of an interesting moment. Um, I haven't actually seen this structure where white gets the doubled pawns. But probably this takes a lot of the oomph out of their position. Yeah, this is just like a lot of trading. Blocking the position. Does not look like they're playing for a win that much. Yeah, I don't think there's anything really especially noteworthy about this draw. It's not much of a fighting draw. But the last game, Xiang won in the 5 plus 3. So let's take a look at that. Um, Duda chose the, uh, what's it called, Elohim defense, which is known to be kind of not so good. So it's an odd choice, but it's 5 plus 3. Maybe he can get away with it. But let's see the, the technique from Xiang. I am really surprised by this 4-pawn attack choice, because I played 4-pawn attack when I was a beginner not so long ago, and it was not very good. I found a lot of resources for black that were kind of annoying, and so I started playing like, I wouldn't play c4 right away, I'd play d4 and knight f3. And um, I have some good ideas against bishop g4. Pawn takes e5 and g6. I know that after pawn takes e5, the best move is knight e5. So just an act, the most active move. Um, and it, it seems much easier to play these lines for white than these four pawn attacks. But maybe he's counting on black making some mistakes in the time pressure. Maybe it's just because I have a lot of uh, experience from both sides here that I like playing the black side more. But I just... I feel like it's more comfortable to play, even in time pressure, um, from the side that's undermining the center. Because all of your moves are pretty natural. Like, e6 to get your bishop involved. 
bishop e7 to have the possibility for castling. So now the king is safe. And then you'll just start destroying the pawns. Knight c6 puts pressure on the pawns. It's not even necessary to play c5 here. But you could play c5 in many of the lines. Probably we're going to see f6 in short order. Again, I haven't seen these games yet, so uh, that's just my my unprofessional professional guess. All right, so black did in fact play f6 sooner than I thought. But it's it's also a logical moment because how else should they improve their position? Like a bishop to the board? That just seems redundant, so why not play f6? Um, okay, so the bishops are very active for black. And, and white has this structure, which is usually... Um, part of the doctor's orders for when you're playing, it's a Slav structure. Like if this pawn was on c6, this would generally be pretty good. One game that had a similar structure to this was, um, what was it? Spassky versus O'Kelly. I think it was O'Kelly to Galway. There's two guys with similar names. Um, and in that game, White hadn't played f4 in exchange for the f pawn. You know, these pawns were still here and black had played c6. It's mostly white side that I think looks similar. This kind of uh, big boat pawn structure. And um, usually the way that you play this is to eventually break with d5. But black is even more active in this position than in that one, so I think that probably black's not doing so bad. Although their, their isolated pawn is very weak. All right, this is a very reasonable transformation. Uh, having the heavy pieces on these D, E, and F files is usually pretty cool. Knight, knight E4 looks like an attempt to destroy the bishop pair. Queen G3 is also kind of inviting bishop F3. I think if black gives up the, the bishop pair, especially the light square bishop, it's not going to be pretty. So here they play bishop F5, which looks like a mistake. Because after, um, after knight F6... If they play queen f6, there's queen takes c7. That looks highly suspicious. And if they play rook takes f6, there's this pressure with the rook lining up. So probably knight h4. Alright, let's see. Knight takes, rook takes. There's also bishop f4 just to try to take this pawn. Maybe a combination of the two. But they chose knight h4. And uh, losing the bishop pair is objectionable. Therefore, bishop c2. Now, rook takes f6. If they play queen takes f6, I think rook f1 would be very, very nice. So they play bishop takes d1. But then, even though this bishop on e2 is hanging, I think white can develop some significant initiative. Like, they're, they're already threatening, like, these different captures on h6. So I'm kind of expecting rook takes h6. Alright, so rook h6 might be redundant, since we really want to play bishop h6. So I think... Rook g6, that's what happened in the game. Knight d4, and bishop h6, I think. Oh, the problem is that we just shouldn't allow knight takes e2, so probably just e3. But white's, white's attack looks pretty overwhelming here. They might have to sacrifice a piece or something. So they play knight e2, bishop h6. After rook d1, I think it's kind of over. They probably should have done something like a king move. I don't know. They just have to get out of here. This looks really dangerous, the attack on g7. Oh, one thing they could do is maybe like this. If they play bishop e3, it's just backing off. So after like king h1, they can play rook d7, I think. Oh no, rook d1 is, is winning. So they'd play... I guess they have to play bishop e3. And where do we move our queen? I don't know. Maybe do this first. So we do everything in check. Oh yeah, this is much more clever. Stinky Tracy is tuning in. Good to see you again. Just take the pawn on, on c7 with the queen. And catch him by surprise. Surprises win chess games, right? He'd be so shocked that he would instantly resign. I've seen it happen. I'm just kidding. Anyway, so king f2, queen f8. This looks like the same exact position that I was trying to find with queen c5. But the tricky thing is that this bishop is still on h6, making the attack more powerful. 
So I don't like it. I think they should have tried to force bishop e3 before playing queen f8. So a little bit of a tactical mishap in the 5 plus 3. Rook d7, king e2, they just dropped a bishop. I think that probably if they did something like bishop f3 instead, like this, we'd be looking at a check. We're threatening queen g7. They'd have to play rook d7, I think. And then probably just pawn f3. Good game. So the game ended similarly, I guess. They they just dropped their bishop on e2. And uh, sparks began to fly after they played knight g5. If the move king g6 occurs, then knight e6 wins the queen. So that's pretty straightforward. King h8, knight e6 attacking the queen. We're going to capture on g7 with check no matter what. Bishop d4, check. Um, they have to play king h7 or king f7. If they play king h7, knight f8 looks... Oh no, knight f8 runs into queen f8. So probably it would be rook g7. And after king f7, it would be rook g7. No, then the knight hangs. So rook f6. And it uh, looks like they resigned here because they're going to lose the queen. So that was the, that was the whole match, essentially. And... Um, I enjoyed catching up on it, and I hope you guys um, liked my impromptu commentary uh, on the subject. So uh, if you like that, please give me a follow. Also, um, there's a Discord. There's a YouTube. So uh, give me a follow. Join the, join the Discord so you can talk to the rest of the community. I only recently started streaming uh, when the sun's out, and most of my community is like online at night so if you guys want to meet those people who you wouldn't normally see um definitely join the discord and um since i have some stuff to do i'm just gonna check out here so thanks for uh making it great by joining in